Today's epistle lesson, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, mentions both Corinth and Ephesus, both of which were major cities in the ancient world. Corinth in modern-day Greece, Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, were each a thousand years old already by the first century A.D. Just let that wash over you. Both Corinth and Ephesus were founded in the 10th century B.C. Washington, D.C. is less than 300 years old. The reference in Acts today refers to cities that were a thousand years old already, 2,000 years ago. Both Corinth and Ephesus were Gentile territory, far from Jerusalem. There would have been Jewish communities in each city, to be sure, but the vast majority of potential converts to Christianity were Gentiles. So in our lesson today, Paul has made it to Ephesus, and in verse 2 of the passage, he says, to the handful of disciples he finds there, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul gets to the essence of the issue in following Jesus Christ. Do you have the gift of the Holy Spirit? Do you recognize the Holy Spirit's presence in your life? In his introductory comments to today's passage, Carl Holliday writes, the interchange in verse 2 assumes that the Holy Spirit is the defining mark of Christian identity. It's a strong statement. What is it to be a follower of Christ? It is to have received the Holy Spirit. In his introductory comments to the passage, Fred Craddock writes, for all the varieties of interpretations of the Holy Spirit, this gift was the hallmark of the Christian movement. It's a lot in that one sentence. To this day, there are countless experiences of the Holy Spirit, some dramatic, some in that still, small voice. But it's the same gift, and both Dr. Holliday and Dr. Craddock are saying that Paul is saying to be a follower of Christ is to have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a hallmark, Fred Craddock says, of being a follower of Christ. I looked up the word hallmark this week. I knew what it meant, and you know what it means, but occasionally it's good to see the actual definition. And a hallmark is a distinguishing characteristic, a distinguishing trait or feature. So to say that the Holy Spirit is the hallmark of the Christian experience is to say it's foundational to our understanding of our relationship with God in Christ. What Paul was saying, and what Holiday and Craddock are saying in our time, is baptism is our entry into a relationship with the living God, not merely a ritual, not merely a rite of passage. Living water washes over us to bring us into a living relationship with the living God. The defining mark of Christian identity, the hallmark of the Christian movement, baptism. So today is the first Sunday after the Epiphany. The 12 days of Christmas have now rolled into the season of Epiphany. The first Sunday after the Epiphany is known as the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the feast of the baptism. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so baptism is in the air today, all throughout the liturgy. And at 1045 this morning, we will have three baptisms in the context of that worship service. In commenting on today's epistle lesson, in the context of the first Sunday after the Epiphany, Carl Holliday writes, as one reflects on the historical and theological significance of Jesus' own baptism, it becomes an appropriate time for us to reflect on the significance of our own baptism. And that's the theme of today's worship. To celebrate the baptism of Jesus and to ponder the significance of our own baptism. And so today, in part, we look to the past to remember Jesus submitting to the baptism of John. But looking into the past brings us right back to the present and our own experience of baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Since mid-Advent through the end of this month, we are averaging more than one baptism a week in this church. For an Episcopal church in the Southeast United States, that's unusual. More than one baptism a week over an extended period of time. We have three children being baptized today. Next week, an adult is being baptized. The week after that, another child is being baptized. And this started back in mid Advent. So baptism's in the air here, not just today, but already in the life of this church. Back on the first Sunday of Advent, if you'll remember, Bishop Cole was here and confirmed more than 30 people into a deeper relationship with this parish. And after that great day, we've been having baptisms ever since. So this is a season of growth in the life of this parish. And I encourage us all to remember to be grateful for this inflow of more sisters and brothers. So one of the hallmarks of prayer book worship is the collect of the day. Every Sunday, we pray an opening prayer that is suited particularly for that day, and we call those prayers the collect of the day. And the collect of the day frames worship for that Sunday. It sets the tone for everything that is to follow. So I just want to remind us of the collect of the day for this Sunday. <clears throat> Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit, Grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior. This prayer is meant to frame the entirety of today's worship experience. Today's collect is meant to set the tone for everything that is to follow. And so because today is the feast of the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will say the baptismal covenant in a few moments, the same covenant referred to in the collect of the day. The baptismal covenant begins with a restatement of the creed, but then it goes on to ask us five questions, probing, haunting questions. Many of us are familiar with them. Others of us perhaps are less familiar. But each time we renew the baptismal covenant, we're meant to hear every word of every question. And in that process, to ask ourselves the question, where am I in my walk as a baptized believer? We get to that point in the liturgy when the question is asked, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers? That foundational commitment to active, 
ongoing, disciplined church participation. And then the second question is, will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. Which is a referral to our continuous growth in the life of Christ. Through our successes and through our mistakes, we're always meant to be learning, growing, in our walk with Christ. And then the third question, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ, which is a reminder that we all are meant to be evangelists? I've never in my life stood on a corner holding up a placard. Never. I am called to preach and to teach. You're called to your various ministries based on your gifts and talents. But every one of us is meant to be an evangelist. Some of us preach the word. Some of us teach. Some of us are the hands and feet of God out in the world doing hands-on ministry. But it's all meant to reflect and to draw others to the light of Christ. And then the fourth question, will you seek and, and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Beautiful liturgical language. At the same time, a probing and haunting question. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, including those whom it's not easy to love? But the fourth question reminds us of the journey to become more and more Christ-like over time through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the fifth question, will you strive for justice and peace? That word strive always catches my ear, and it's a challenge every time I hear it. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. I just ask you to hear that prayer today in the context of the moment that is now, with so much division everywhere, war in so many parts of the world, divisions within our own local community, our own church community in some ways in the city, We're to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. One of the great liturgical scholars of our time is a man named Lionel Mitchell. Lee Mitchell wrote a very important book on the 1979 prayer book called Praying Shapes Believing. It's a great title. Praying Shapes, Belie Shapes Believing. And Lee Mitchell says of the baptismal covenant that it is, quote, the ordination vows of the priesthood of all believers. I offer that to you today. When you renew your baptismal covenant in a moment, and I renew mine, this is your ordination. It's a reminder of your ordination to the priesthood of all believers. So I'll conclude with this. Every time I do a baptism, I meet with those who are to be baptized. Sometimes it's an infant, and I'm, you know, holding the child as I meet with that child's parents. Sometimes it's a young child, and I talk to them about who Jesus is. Sometimes it's a teenager, and we have a different level of conversation. Right now, half the people we're baptizing are adults in this run I'm talking about from mid-Advent through January. Half of them are adults, and I'm having the conversation with these adults who have chosen to be baptized. I remember my own conversation when I was 12 years old with the pastor of Ridgeview Baptist Church who came out to talk to me that afternoon about what it meant to be baptized into the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Whatever age of the person I'm talking to, I always make the point 
Baptism is only the beginning. None of us yet are fully formed in Christ. Baptism isn't the end of a process. It's only the beginning. Baptism is not a completion of our journey into Christ. It is the commissioning to a lifetime's journey into Christ. In a sermon for the season of Epiphany, Eugene Peterson says, change is part of the gospel. To evolve, to grow in Christ. To keep learning from our mistakes and to move just that little bit closer to who Christ would have us be. That change is a part of the gospel. We're meant to be evolving into more and more closeness with Christ the length of our days. Peterson also says, none of us is yet whole in Christ. All of us are in the process of becoming. We are not finished products. I can't speak for you. I know it's humbling for me every time I hear the baptismal covenant. I know that it announces my intentions. But every time I say the words, I know I fall short of the aspirations that we have to follow Christ. But all the while, we're meant to be growing continuing to evolve, continuing to take steps forward in living the way Jesus Christ calls us to live. I finish with this one little nugget. Um, I really am trying to break myself of the lifelong habit of reading bumper stickers and window stickers. Sadly, they're getting coarser and coarser over time. If bumper stickers and window stickers used to be funny on the whole, sometimes very educational. Typically they weren't vulgar. So I'm really trying to get out of the habit. But in preparing this sermon, I could not help but remember my favorite bumper sticker of all time. Be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. Amen.